10 comic strips from each decade. Number 10. 1920s, The Cats and Jammer Kids Hans and Fritz were mischievous twins who caused Mama Cats and Jammer and the Captain all sorts of grief. First appearing in the Sunday comics way back in 1897, the Cats and Jammers are still kicking around in syndication today, making them the longest-running comic strip in history. That is the short version of the story, for the longer version is a bit more complicated. Created by Rudolf Dirks, the artist was the caretaker of the twins until 1912. Requesting a sabbatical long before the eras in which they were granted, William Randolph Hearst decided to continue running the popular strip in his New York journal under the steady hand of Dirks' assistant, H. H. Kerr. Miffed at each other, Dirks and Hearst locked horns in a series of court battles to see who ultimately controlled the twins. In a confusing set of rulings, the courts awarded Dirks the right to continue his strip in a competing newspaper, but he had to rename it first. The Captain and the Kids started in 1918 and quickly equaled the popularity of the Cats and Jammer Kids. Because the battle took place during the height of the newspaper wars and the two were so similar in style, many readers were unaware that there were two versions of the same strip out there. The Cats and Jammers found their way into cartoons, comic books, musical theatre, and merchandising throughout the 20s and 30s. Dirks passed the Captain and the Kids on to his son shortly before his death, and that version of the strip ended in 1979. Nur drew the Cats and Jammer Kids until his death in 1949, then a series of other cartoonists took the helm of the franchise. During the 1950s, High Eisman took over the reins and continues to draw the strip in a handful of newspapers today. As Eisman approaches 90 years of age, the future of the kids is dim. Which brings us to number 9, the 1930s, Popeye. Also drawn by High Iceman, the heyday of Popeye was back in the 1930s. First appearing in the comic strip Thimble Theatre in 1929, the talented Elsie Chrysler Seeger changed the name of the strip to Popeye shortly after his appearance. Popeye had become so popular so quickly that by 1933 he was the star of his own cartoon series that turned out to be one of the most popular cartoons of the decade. By the end of the decade, Seagar had passed away, and a team of rotating artists ran the strip for the syndicate. Popeye had become such a ground-breaking moneymaker for King Features Syndicate that they licensed him for anything. Comic books, movies, cartoons, merchandising, radio shows, and, generations later, multiple video games across multiple formats. Number 8. The 1940s. Little Orphan Annie. Launched back in 1924 by Harold Gray, Little Orphan Annie was one of the most popular comics in the 1930s, with the story focused on the soap opera of Annie, her dog, and millionaire Daddy Warbucks. But as war and rumors of war began to surface in the late 30s, the strip began to get more and more political. By the 1940s, the storyline was fully submerged in the real-life storyline of World War II. Depending on your politics at the time, Gray was praised or criticized for having Annie involved in the war efforts. Multiple storylines involving Daddy Warbucks paralleled Gray's distaste for U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt. Little Orphan Annie was the first comic strip adapted to a radio show, and later her adventures were adapted to film and Broadway. Then the Broadway show was readapted to film. Annie and the gang survived the war in the comic strip, but the storyline continued to be rooted in current events until Gray's death in 1968. Annie staggered along for 40 more years under multiple cartoonists until the strip was cancelled in 2010, with, of all things, a cliffhanger ending. Number 7. 1950. Dennis the Menace Started in 1951 by Hank Ketchum in only 16 newspapers, Dennis the Menace followed the misadventures of five-year-old Dennis Mitchell, his nuclear family, and his foil, Mr. Wilson. Within a decade, Dennis's popularity soared to over a thousand newspapers, a live-action TV show, and comic books. As with most popular strips, Dennis then found himself in cartoon form and a merchandising titan, becoming the licensed mascot of Dairy Queen for 30 years. In 1994, Hank Ketchum retired and passed the torch to some of his assistants, who continue the Dennis the Menace storyline to this day. The latest live-action Dennis movie was 2007's A Dennis the Menace Christmas, starring Robert Wagner and Louise Fletcher. Number 6. 1960. Peanuts. The Peanuts gang had an original run of 50 years from 1950 to 2000. Following Charlie Brown and his friends through the 50s, creator Charles Schulz continued to add characters, tweak storylines, and really find his footing as a cartoonist. 
By the early 60s, Peanuts had hit its stride and was considered one of the greatest comic strips of all time, even landing on the cover of Time magazine in 1965. Crossing over to cartoons, peanut specials made 50 years ago are still considered holiday classics today. Snoopy, Charlie Brown, Linus Lucy, and Peppermint Patty are all universal icons, known even to the most casual of pop culture observers. Schulz was also a shrewd businessman, for besides the cartoons and film specials, theatrical productions, sound recordings, amusement parks, and video games, Charlie Brown was a celebrity pitchman for companies as diverse as MetLife, Hallmark Cards, Coca-Cola, and Dolly Madison Snack Cakes. Schulz was concerned about the strip's legacy after he was gone, and thus he ended its original run just a month prior to his death. Classic peanut strips that run from its golden era can still be read today. Number 5. 1970. Doonesbury Springing forth from Yale newspaper's Bull Tales, Doonesbury started where the former left off in 1970. Not quite a comic strip, not quite a political cartoon, Doonesbury started off focusing on 20-somethings Mike Doonesbury and BD as roommates. Quickly, the strip evolved into the lives of even the most remote associates of Mike and BD, as the strip was as funny as it was scathing in its political commentary. In 1975, Doonesbury's creator, Gary Trudeau, won the Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning for his work with the strip, but other than one animated special and a Broadway musical of the strip, Doonesbury simply presses the hot button too often to effectively cross over into other realms of media. Newspapers opt not to publish some strips, some move it out of the comic section and into the editorial section, and yet others have cancelled it altogether. The latest such episode occurred in 2012, when Trudeau lampooned multiple states for their changes in abortion laws. Number 4. 1980. Bloom County. Following the exploits of the talking penguins, Opus, the putrid Bill the Cat, and their human companions, Bloom County practically defined the 80s, running from 1980 to 1989, with its pulse kept keenly on current events, winning creator Berkeley breathed the Pulitzer Prize in editorial cartooning in 1987. Like a shooting star, Bloom County burned bright, but only for a relatively short time. Bloom County spun off to Sunday-only offshoots Outland 1989-1995 and Opus 2003-2008. Both then were well-drawn and moderately funny, but the cutting-edge wit was replaced by a broader, preachier version of Bloom County, with many of the characters left out of the Sunday-only forays. Number 3. 1990s. Farside, Calvin and Hobbes. In 1994, two of the best movies of the year were Pulp Fiction and Forrest Gump, but both were very, very different movies. In the same way, two great comic strips ended in 1995, The Far Side and Calvin and Hobbes, and the debate rages over which comic strip was better, because they were both awesome in very, very different ways. Your opinion probably says more about you than the quality of the work done by Gary Larson and Bill Watterson, honestly. The Far Side started in 1980 and was simply a one-panel comic strip showing a unique perspective on the absurdities of life. There were no recurring characters, only recurring types of characters. The star of the strip was the subversiveness that was layered upon the truth. Penned by Gary Larson, the strip was shown in nearly 2,000 newspapers around the world when production ended. From 1989 to Strip's End in 1995, Larson took home major awards yearly. Each one of Larson's 23 compilation Far Side books reached the New York Times bestseller list, but other than a few stabs at animation and selling a ton of calendars and greeting cards, Larson has been fairly quiet since the Strip's session. And talking about being quiet, Bill Watterson started the wonderful strip Calvin and Hobbes in 1985, centering on six-year-old Calvin and his stuffed tiger Hobbes. The beauty of the concept is that Hobbes is only alive in Calvin's imagination. Watterson took ten years, minus two hiatuses, to flesh out the exuberance of youth, mostly unaffected by the outside world. Like Larson, by 1990, Watterson had begun to accumulate awards, including winning syndicated comic strip of the year every single year of the 1990s until the strip's completion. Watterson himself was fiercely protective of the comic strip as an art form, allowing practically no merchandising or alternate formats for Calvin to be licensed. Other than compilation books of the strips, which have sold 45 million units worldwide, anything else with Calvin's image is a blatant circumvention of copyright law. So legendary is Watterson's reclusiveness that it inspired a 2013 documentary called Dear Mr. Watterson. Number 2. The 2000s. Dilbert. 
Launched in 1989, it took a few years for Scott Adams's crude drawings to take a hold with the comic strip-loving public. Spot on observations pertaining to the business world, along with a razor-sharp wit, carried it until the cartooning caught up with the writing. Since then, Adams has won numerous awards for his strip, which centers around socially awkward engineer Dilbert and the characters that rotate around him in his corporate universe. Dilbert is currently in over 2,000 newspapers worldwide, is licensed to over 100 products, and was briefly a cartoon in 1999-2000. But perhaps the most awesome thing associated with Dilbert's image is the Dil Burrito, a healthy, microwavable burrito that briefly invaded the market back in 2000. Number 1. 2010s. Pearls Before Swine Helped along at its origin by a seal of approval from Scott Adams, Pearls Before Swine entered syndication in 2001 and has slowly gained steam since. Stephen Pastis pens the strip starring a cast of generically named animals such as rat, pig, goat, and the crocodile family. Every so often, Pastis makes a guest appearance in the strip as himself. Still in its infancy, as far as comic strips go, most of Pearls' outside income comes from compilation books of the strip as well as stuffed animals. Pastis has been nominated as Cartoonist of the Year each of the past five years, and even though his work has been animated in a few places on the internet, look for a network like Adult Swim or Fox to eventually make a hard sell for animating the strip for the masses. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscribe button in the top right. Our channel has loads of other awesome videos just like this.